how to play Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is a 25-year-old trading card game where your goal is to kill your opponent by casting spells and throwing monsters at them until they stop moving. Another option would be to actually use your cards to win the game the normal way, but murdering the opposition does technically make you the victor if you don't have time to memorize 905.6 rules plus appendices, glossaries, subrules, fan fiction, and a table of contents. If you're interested in actually playing the game, you're going to need cards. Lots of cards. You get these cards by throwing money at wizards until they get tired of having money thrown at them and then they show you the secret of their powers, which is cards. Alternatively, you could buy them at Walmart or Target, but don't. Instead, you should buy them at your friendly, friendly local, local game, game store or flugs, where they'll probably be cheaper, have a wider selection, and give you a nice place to play with the friends you have and meet new friends. Your flugs should also be able to provide you with a free sample deck of cards that comes in a cool box like this if you don't want to spend your money on wizardry just yet. So now that you have your cards, you're gonna need friends. This is the hardest step. Most people aren't your friends, and people who aren't your friends are scary. But you want to play wizard cards, and you can't play wizard cards alone, so you're gonna have to bite that bullet. The easiest way not to be scared of people who aren't your friends is to make them your friends. Normally that's really difficult, but now you have your cards. Go to your friendly local, local game store, store and find a person. Then say, hey, my name is Tammy, I want to be your friend. And they'll say, psh, Tammy, why would I want to be friends with Tammy? And you'll say, I have wizard cards, and they'll say, oh man, wizard cards? I love wizard cards. You're my best friend, Tammy. Let's play a game of 1v1 plane chase vanguard commander with scheme decks, no items, fox only, final destination. And then bam, you got yourself a friend. Now you may have noticed that you have no idea what any of those words mean. Don't worry, I'm here to help. Here's how to play. Life points, you start with 20 of them, or sometimes 40, but usually 20, and if you have zero, you lose. Usually. It's a weird game. Conversely, if your opponent has zero, they lose. Your goal is to make your opponent lose before you lose, and you do this using cards. How many cards? 60 cards. Or 40, or 100, but usually 60. By now, you should have around 400 cards and not be sure where most of them came from. You're gonna want to grab 60 of those and shuffle them all together into a big pile called a library, or deck, if you're not a massive pedantic nerd. After you've done that, have some small talk with your opponent and decide who goes first. You can do this however you want. Die roll, staring contest, arm wrestling, Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, up to you. But after you've decided, lick the top card of your deck for luck and then draw seven cards. All of the cards in your hand should look vaguely like this. If they look like this, that's fine, but if they look like this, you should replace that and find a real magic card. But what does all of the this mean? Get your notepads out, kids, because it's time to go over card anatomy. Every card has a name, mana cost, picture, type line, set symbol, and text box. The name is what the card is called, and you're allowed to have up to four cards with the same name in one deck, or one card, or as many as you want, but usually four, with one exception. Eight exceptions. The mana cost is how much and what type of mana you need to play the card. We'll talk about how to get mana in a minute, but for now you need to know that there are five colors of it. White, blue, black, red, and green, in that order, plus this colorless wingding thing and a snowflake. A number in the middle of a gray circle can be paid with any color of mana or colorless mana. Colorless is not a color. The type line tells you what type of card it is, along with any subtypes and super types. The card type will tell you roughly how a card is played and what kind of thing it'll do when you play it. The set symbol tells you where a specific card comes from. New Wizardry the Happening cards are released roughly four times a year in 200-ish card expansions called sets, and the symbol will tell you which set a card comes from. The color of the set symbol tells you how rare a card is, with black being the least most rare and green being the most most rare. The text box tells you what the card does. Uh-oh, all these cards look different. What's this thing? What's that thing? What's this thing? That one has nothing to do with magic, but my old landlady had it hanging up in my apartment for like nine months and I really want to know. So, there are seven types of cards, eight types of cards, there are 13 types of cards, but seven types of cards you have to worry about. Land cards. Every turn you're allowed to play one land card. What do lands do? Well, remember that mana cost thing I talked about earlier? This is how you get that. When you want to play a card, you can tap your lands to get mana. To tap something, turn it sideways. A common misconception among new players is that the lands themselves are mana. This is untrue. Flavor-wise, you're like a giant multi-dimensional oil rig drawing mana out of the land. For example, if you've got this forest here, you can turn it sideways to add one green mana to your mana pool. The mana pool is not a physical thing that exists. Unless you play Storm, don't play Storm. It's a metaphorical representation of the amount of mana you have. So if you tap something like this Gruel Turf, which adds a red mana and a green mana to your mana pool, you can use that mana to play a Gruel Charm, or a Lightning Greaves, or a Shock and a Giant Growth, or you could just play this Land of War Elves and let that red mana disappear without doing anything. But wait, what's that weird arrow symbol in the text box of Land of War Elves? That's the tap symbol. That means you can turn the card sideways to do a thing. This thing. Add one green to your mana pool. That does not mean search your deck for a forest and put it onto the battlefield. It means you can tap this land war elves and it'll add one mystical green point to your imaginary pool of mystical points that you can use to play cards. This is just
just like tapping a forest. All basic lands are implied to have text that says tap this card to add one mana of the corresponding color to your mana pool. Speaking of, there's something called a basic land. There are six types of basic lands. Plains, islands, swamps, mountains, forests, sis, and wastes. Each one taps for a different color of mana, or colorless mana, and you can have as many of them as you want in a deck. You can have four, or twelve, or thirty-nine, or eight hundred, or zero, but typically since lands are pretty important, they're going to make up roughly a third of your deck. Next type, enchantments. Enchantments are the easiest card type to understand. No tricky mechanics, no turning sideways, no enchantment pool. You play them, they get put on the battlefield, and they have some kind of static effect. Sometimes enchantment spells will say, like, enchant creature, or enchant land, in which case the enchantment is attached to the thing it enchants, and the effect of the enchantment only applies to the card it's attached to and no others. Artifacts are a lot like enchantments, except that they usually don't require any colored mana, and they will sometimes have abilities that require them to tap. Keep in mind, you can only tap any given card once per turn. Once it's sideways, it's sideways, and you can't turn it sideways again. Next up is Planeswalkers. Planeswalkers are ultra-powerful wizards who owe you a favor. When you play a Planeswalker, you're cashing in on that favor by asking them to come in and help you beat the crap out of this other wizard. In the lower right corner of a Planeswalker card, you'll see a number. Each Planeswalker enters the battlefield with that many loyalty counters, and the more loyalty counters a Planeswalker has, the more they feel inclined to stick around. Each Planeswalker also has a certain number of abilities, usually three, and you can use those abilities to help you with the aforementioned crap beating. You're allowed to use one of these abilities per Planeswalker per turn, and using them will either increase or decrease the amount of loyalty counters on that Planeswalker by the amount shown. Plus means put more on, minus means take some off. When a Planeswalker has zero loyalty counters, it is destroyed and goes to the graveyard. The most common way to get your opponent from 20 to zero is to lob monsters at them until they fall over. Unfortunately, creature cards are probably the hardest to understand besides instants. Each creature card has two numbers in the lower right corner, power on the left and toughness on the right. When two creatures duke it out, each deals damage to the other equal to its power, which means you have to subtract the opposing creature's power from your creature's toughness and vice versa. When a creature has zero toughness or less, it dies and goes to its owner's graveyard. Now, being pulled through the ether to join a wizard war is really disorienting for your everyday badger, so you're gonna have to give them a little bit of time to adjust before you can order them around. This is called summoning sickness, and in game terms it means that you aren't allowed to attack with creatures or use their tap abilities until the turn after you play them. You can, however, use abilities that don't cause the creature to tap, like this one, just pay the cost listed to the left of the ability. Note, a lot of magic cards refer to casting spells. Every single card you play that isn't a land is a spell. You cast creatures and planeswalkers and artifacts just like you cast enchantments and sorceries. Cast a spell is just magic keys for play a card. Sometimes a card will stick around on the battlefield after you cast it. When that happens, it stops being a spell and becomes something called a permanent. Every card type we've talked about so far would be an example of a permanent, and you can have as many permanents on the battlefield at once as you want. There are also two types of cards that never touch the battlefield and basically go directly from your hand to the graveyard with a little detour that we'll talk about in a minute, and those are instants and sorceries. Sorcery spells can only be cast during your turn, and they tend to have one-time effects like drawing cards or destroying permanents. You cast them, they do what they say in the box, and they go to the graveyard. Instants are where everything gets all screwy because now I have to explain the stack. Okay, so, instants are special because you can cast them at basically any time. Your turn? Check. Opponent's turn? Check. Did your opponent just play a card? Well, screw you, now I'm playing a card. Did you just play a card? Well, screw me, now I'm playing another card. This gets tricky when you get to cards like this. Now, every time you cast a spell in magic, before anything happens, it goes to this little limbo room called the stack. While a spell is on the stack, your opponent has the opportunity to play something in response to it, almost always an instant. If they don't, great, your spell happens, just like Mama always wanted. If they do, then their spell goes on the stack, and it goes on the stack on top of your spell. Now, imagine this like a physical stack. When we go to resolve all of these abilities, the spell on top of the stack gets resolved first, then the one below it, and so on. Take a look at this scenario. Your opponent has a 2-2 Grizzly Bear on the field, and you don't like it. So you decide you're gonna shoot it with lightning and kill it. Your opponent then has the chance to respond. They don't want their bear shot with lightning, so they decide they need a bigger bear. In response to your lightning bolt, they cast Giant Growth. Now we go down the stack, resolving spells in the opposite of the order in which they were cast. Giant Growth resolves first, giving the bear an additional 3 power and toughness. Then, Lightning Bolt resolves, dealing 3 damage to the bear. Because of the Giant Growth, 3 damage isn't enough to reduce the bear to 0 toughness or less, and now you're staring down the muzzle of a giant angry grizzly that's probably also on fire.
Oops. Let's go back. You bolt the bear. Your opponent casts giant growth, but suppose you don't want to fight a giant angry grizzly that's probably also on fire. Well, just like your opponent responded to lightning bolt, you now have a chance to respond to giant growth. Luckily, you have a counter spell in hand. Tap that mana, kid. We're having bear for supper. Countering a spell means that the countered spell does nothing. They may as well have tried to pump their bear with their grandma's famous mint pudding recipe for all the good it'll do. Now, your counter spell is on top of the stack. If your opponent doesn't respond, counter spell will resolve first. This counters giant growth. Then counter spell will go to the graveyard and giant growth will resolve, but since it's been countered, it does nothing and goes to the graveyard ashamed. Then lightning comes down from the heavens and roasts the bear stone dead. Lightning bolt goes to the graveyard, the bear goes to the graveyard, and now whoever's turn it is can keep going. Hopefully now we understand permanent spells in the stack. Now we can go over the phases of a turn. Every turn in magic consists of five parts. The beginning phase, the pre-combat main phase, the combat phase, the post combat main phase, and the ending phase. The beginning phase happens exactly when you think it happens and consists of three sub-phases called steps. First is the untap step. You remember all those times we talked about turning cards sideways to use their special abilities? Well, during the untap step, you take all of those sideways cards and turn them sideways again, except this time you do it the other way. Then there's the upkeep step. Sometimes cards will say to do something at the beginning of your upkeep. This is when you do those things. This is also the point when creatures you played last turn get over summoning sickness, meaning that you can attack with them and use their tap abilities now. Other than that, you can basically ignore it. Finally, there's the draw step. This is where you draw a card from your- how did that get in there? This is where you draw a card from your deck. Be careful though, if your deck has no more cards in it and you would have to draw a card, you lose the game, unless you don't. After the beginning phase is the pre-combat main phase. The main phase is where cards get played. This is the point where you can summon creatures, build artifacts, enchant things, ask planeswalkers for help, land, do, land, etc. If you want to play a card, this is when you do it. Combat phase. The combat phase is also divided into steps. Five steps. First is the beginning of combat step. It's an upkeep for combat. After that is the declare attackers step. This is where you decide which of your little Pokemon are going to go and rip out your opponent's throat. To attack with a creature, first, check to see that the conditions of the universe are such that the inviolable laws of physics will allow the various thoughtless particles that have come together to create the illusion of yourself to come to that decision. Second, convince yourself that attacking with the creature or not is your own free choice rather than the inevitable result of millennia of physical processes marching toward the only truly possible outcome of their cold mechanical existence. Third, clearly inform your opponent that you are attacking with such and such a creature. Fourth, turn it sideways. Repeat this process for every creature with which you wish to attack. Note, you may attack with as many or as few creatures as you wish, but all attackers must be declared at the same time. Attacking creatures are also all attacking your opponent, unless they aren't. The only exception is if your opponent controls a planeswalker, in which case you can send some of the creatures at your opponent and other of the planeswalker. What you can't do is directly attack your opponent's creatures. That's a low blow no-go, bro. Then comes the declare blockers step, where your opponent gets to decide which of their creatures they love least and use them as meat shields. If a creature is blocked, it will deal damage to the creature or creatures that blocked it instead of dealing damage to its original target. Your opponent may assign as many or as few blockers as they want to block each of your attacks. After blockers are declared, we move on to the combat damage step. This is when everything kills everything else, and a few things can happen. Suppose this is the board state. You've got a giant hulk and worm, and your opponent has 23 squirrels. It's combat on your turn, and you decide to attack with the aforementioned giant hulk and worm. First, let's say your opponent decides not to block it. Great! Your worm goes through, and we move to the combat damage step. Since your worm has 7 power, your opponent loses 7 points and goes down to 13. Silly opponent, that 7 damage was easily preventable. Let's rewind. You swing with the worm, except that this time your opponent isn't a total moron and decides that they want to block it, so they throw a particularly terrified squirrel in the way. For some reason, your worm just can't get past that squirrel. So when the combat damage step comes around, your worm deals 7 damage to the squirrel and the squirrel deals 1 damage to your worm. This happens at the same time. Your ruination worm goes down to 5 toughness and your opponent's squirrel goes down to negative 6. When a creature has 0 toughness or less, it explodes and goes to the graveyard. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten, squirrel friend. On your opponent's turn, they want vengeance and they decide they're going to attack you with all the squirrels. Squirrels. Oh no! Your only creature is tapped, and in another three seconds, you're going to learn that tapped creatures can't block! You're helpless! Squirrels overrun you, and you take 22 damage, sending you down to negative 2 life. 
Some say the game will end in fire, some say in ice, but this is how the game ends. Not with a bang, but with a whisker. Or maybe not. Let's rewind again. Let's rewind again. Let's rewind again. Suppose you have this enchantment out on the field when you send your worm to devour your opponent's face. Well, now your opponent knows that they won't be able to attack you with all those squirrels next turn. Drat! But they want to take this opportunity to get rid of that pesky worm. Here's what they do. Instead of sending just one squirrel to absorb the damage, they send an army. Ten squirrels! Your worm doesn't know what to do. It's never been bitten by this many squirrels at once before. The combat damage step rolls around. It does its best, but it only has seven power to divide up among ten squirrels. It chomps and thrashes, dealing seven total damage, one damage to each squirrel until it just can't anymore. But the squirrels fight back. Each squirrel deals one damage to your worm for a whopping ten total damage. There are casualties on both sides. Your worm took out a good chunk of the rodential blockade, but it could not break through. Your worm, having gone down to negative four toughness, collapses and retires to the graveyard. The three surviving squirrels, covered in the blood of their brave comrades return to your opponent's side of the field. Okay, now let's say you have 40 worms and your opponent's got this planeswalker thing and a desperate need for new pants. You could just kill your opponent with 40 worms, but you once saw that planeswalker kick a puppy and now you really want it dead. In order to attack a planeswalker, choose which creature you want to attack with and say, I am attacking this planeswalker with 35 worms. Your opponent can't do anything about that, so your worms deal 245 damage to Nickel Bolas. When dealing damage to a planeswalker, subtract the total damage from that planeswalker's loyalty. Because this brings old Nicky's loyalty down to zero or less, he decides that your opponent is more trouble than they're worth and heads off to the graveyard. You could also send three of those barbs at Nicol Bolas and 37 of them at your opponent, killing both if you're feeling particularly vindictive and efficient. After damage is done, we move to the end of combat step. Combat ends. After the end of combat step, there's another main phase just like the first one. Pro tip, since you can't attack with most creatures the turn that you play them, it's smart to play your creatures after combat so that your opponent doesn't take them into account when deciding what blocks to make. After that main phase is the ending phase. The ending phase has two steps. First is the end step, which is basically just like the upkeep. Things happen sometimes, but usually not. And then the cleanup step. During the cleanup step, you have to do two things. First, see how many cards you have in your hand and compare that number to seven. If the number of cards in your hand is more than seven, you have to discard cards until you have seven, unless you don't. After that, any of your creatures that were damaged stop being damaged. Remember the worm in our first example that took a bite from that terrified hero squirrel? Well, that bite heals now and it goes back up to six toughness. Damage does not stick around for more than a turn in magic. After that, your opponent gets a turn and it goes just like your turn. Keep doing this until one of you stops. And that should just about cover it. If you have any questions, and you will, the comprehensive rulebook is available for free. Link in the description. If you have any complaints, and you will, blame Mark Rosewater. That's M-A-R-K Rosewater. And if you're hesitant about spending egregious amounts of money on cardboard, don't be. Think of it like this. Spending $10 on a tiny slip of paper is ridiculous. But if that tiny slip of paper is a movie ticket, then you're spending $10 for two hours of fun. That's what you do with magic. You aren't buying cardboard, you're buying the experience of cardboard. Playing, trading, collecting, building card houses, friends. That's what magic is. The first, best, and most complicated trading card game on the market. Good luck, wizard friend, and have fun. <laughs> E X P L A N A T I O N point. There are two things you need to know. Number one. In my vid from two weeks ago, I say that there will be a delay in SAO vid number two. Turns out that that wasn't quite true. I got into the creative mood and the move is going smooth. Watch my sub count getting higher every day. I wish I could hear what little Pedro had to say. Three weeks is not a lot of time for such a dare. But you win, beat him with a week to spare. Weekly vids! And I know that this ain't the vid I promised. But I'm not the type for being utterly dishonest. Stuff is going on, but it should be finished forthright. The SAO abridged vid is coming in a fort. Number two! Unless you follow me, there's no way you could know. But my Patreon launched about five days ago. You can find it at the link in the description description, or help me out in other ways like comments and subscriptions. Twitter! As for rewards, here's what non-patrons lack. Notes, scripts, unfinished vids, and commentary tracks. More rewards! And if you got a bit of cash to blow, send in your picture and I'll put it in a video. They won't teach you this in your classes, but if you want, I'll make you appeal to the masses. I'll review your vids once a month.
Meet you on Skype, and nothing really rhymes with month, but every month I'll look over one of your videos, and we'll meet for an hour-long Skype session and go over things that you do right and how to improve and stuff like that. So subscribe! Click that little button and the bell chime to get notifications. Until next time, this has been... E-X-P-L-A-N-A-T-I-O-N Point! Signing autographs out back, one per person, please form an orderly line.